Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. Uh, tonight I wanted to share a couple of points uh, with you. Uh, a couple of people over this last week have asked questions about the calendar. So I thought I would uh, do a quick overview and look at a few points, things that are upcoming on the calendar. And there's also one thing I wanted to share with you from uh, a fragment on Ezekiel. And as we've been talking about, um, we have the actual Bible texts. So for instance, we've got large sections of Ezekiel that are just Ezekiel. Maybe they'll have an extra sentence or two or flip a phrase around, uh, but pretty much just Ezekiel. But then we have commentaries, and then some people are thinking there are, uh, this is a, a fragment of something called pseudo-Ezekiel. So some people might think it is a, a different version of Ezekiel or second Ezekiel. It's been called things like that. And it's my contention that it's simply a different form of a commentary. And either way, we want to look at it and just kind of see what it says. So let's start off by doing that. Let me show you, um, let's see what we've got here. This uh, is some uh, information I was taking. Uh, this is scroll 4Q284. And it is part of what is called a purification ritual. And I just thought it was kind of interesting. And this is kind of a, a segue into our calendar thing. Um, and basically, it's uh, it's a fragment, just a few lines, and it's talking about um, purification rituals you do at certain times. So for Yom Kippur, for instance, the priests do certain rituals. The high priest does a certain ritual. On the Sabbath, there are purification rituals, things that you do and don't do to be ceremonial clean. But in the process, it doesn't tell us what they do, but in the process, uh, it says this. And if we look here on... Uh, fragment 1, line 3, it basically just says this, the Sabbath, each of the weeks of, probably of the year. So there's 52 Sabbaths in a year. Line number 4 says, uh, of the year and it's 12 months. And it's interesting because the Dead Sea Scrolls continually talk about 12 months in a year. There's never 13 months. And that's the way the modern Jewish calendar does it. Once every three years, three to four years, there has to be a leap a month uh, to set it back because they want to start their year, always start their year and every month on a new moon. So it's a lunar type cycle. Uh, it's called a soli lunar month or a lunisolar month, combination of both. Um, but anyway, so occasionally you have a leap month and... We, on a Gregorian calendar, have a leap day every four years because we have a 365-day year. They have a th modern Jewish calendar, that is, has a 354-day calendar, so almost 10 days, sometimes 11 uh, per year. So in three years, you should have a month to add up. So um, the Dead Sea Scroll calendar has a leap week, so... Uh, kind of interesting that way, but only the modern Jewish calendar, a lunar calendar or a solar lunar combination calendar would have a leap month. Most of us would not wait to get an entire month off before we fix our calendar. So anyway, so there's a Sabbath, there's 52 weeks in the Sabbath uh, because there's 12 months in the year. We'll get to that in a little bit, but I thought this was interesting. So they're doing some sort of ritual of purification every Sabbath and something about on the months of the year, probably the first of the months or festivals in the months or whatever, but there's 12 of them. And then line five says, and the four seasons of year on the days of something. And most likely we're talking about some sort of purification ritual on the four seasons of year, on the exact days of the year. So it probably is going to say on the Tekufa. Um, and so we understand that the calendar is divided, or a year, no matter how you calculate it or use it, it's divided into four seasons. There's spring, summer, winter, or fall and winter. So winter is up in, perfectly, it's almost always on March 20th, because our Gregorian calendar tries to get uh, the days perfectly aligned with the equinox every year. 
and that messes up our weeks. Uh, their calendar wants to keep the weeks perfect and then still get as close to the equinox every year. So that's why they have a leap week instead of a leap day. 364 days per year, which is an even um, amount divisible by 52 weeks. So 52 weeks of seven days per week is 364 days. So every five to six years, they have an extra week to put their calendar back. Um, and then the, uh, the uh, months of the modern Jewish calendar is kind of off in a lot of ways. So anyway, the point being here, I just thought this was interesting. So this is a purification ritual teaching you that on every Sabbath, they did some sort of a, a rite, a festival, a uh, purification ceremony for the priests. Doesn't apply to us, but just the fact that it existed. So every Sabbath, which makes sense, uh, every month, some sort of ritual per month, and then the four seasons of the year, so the Takufas. So we'll get back to that in a little bit. So I thought that was pretty interesting. One of the things that I thought was really cool about, and I'll skip now to Ezekiel, and then we'll just kind of go back to the calendar because it's just a side note on Ezekiel at this point. But we're going through, we have major portions of uh, Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, 39, you know, those, those things. And most of us believe, for very good reasons, that the Magog Magog War of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is yet future. Uh, Magog is defined as Russia, according to Jasher and several other old texts. So we know it's a Russian invasion of Israel. Uh, Turkey may or may not have something to do with it, also, but um, you know, as it's described. Uh, but backing up one, we have Ezekiel 37 which is the chapter right before the Gog Magog Wars. So Ezekiel 37 talks about a valley of dry bones. And just to remind you of it, and we won't take time to look it up, but um, just to remind you of it, Ezekiel has this vision. God talks to him and said, what do you see? And there's this big valley, just a bunch of bones, like skeletons, been there for who knows how long, ages and ages. So he says, can these... Bones. Well, who are they first? They're the whole house of Israel. Can they live? And he says, you know, I have no idea. And so he says, speak and prophesy to them. The bones start coming back together. Uh, the meat, the sinews, the blood vessels, the skin, all that kind of stuff. And it comes, they come back to basically to life physically, but there's no breath in them. So there's no, they're not perfect. And so we translate that to be that the nation of Israel will come back as a nation, but not believing in Messiah. There's no breath or spirit in them. So they're looking for a Messiah, but they don't, they're not messianic, which is exactly what happened in 1948. The nation of Israel was revived as prophesied. We've talked about that before too, the prophecy about them being revived as a nation um, the fragment of Daniel actually talking about fragment chapter four, rather of Daniel actually giving us the date of which it would occur, which is supposed to be May 14th, 1948. They were supposed to revive the Hebrew language, etc. But one thing is according to Ezekiel 37, then they're supposed to come back looking for a Messiah, but not filled with the spirit, not recognizing the Messiah, not being messianic which is true. That's what happened. It was many years later when the really hardcore messianic movement began in Israel. And now we have a lot of believing Jews or messianic Jews, not the majority at all, but a large section. So this is what's going on. Now through the centuries, some people, Christian and Jewish both, have said that this represents the physical resurrection. You know, and it kind of sounds like it. There's a bunch of bones, they stand up and they become alive again. But it's obviously talking about that. Now, as a Christian, we also tend to go to uh, the book of Matthew and Luke, but the book of Matthew, uh, Jesus uh, uh, talks about the budding of the fig tree. And we've talked about that a little bit, but basically he sees the fig tree, there's no fruit on it. He curses it, it withers and dies. And he talks about, the budding of the fig tree. And so the symbolism is 
The fig tree represents Israel. We don't really know why, but it just kind of does. You can kind of tell that in the text. And there is a time when Israel is there. They reject Messiah. They're cursed and the nation dies and they're dispersed. There's a time when the fig tree buds again. It comes back. Now, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, to stop on this for a minute, there's other scrolls that predict the coming of Messiah. Many of those do. But Messiah comes from a unique group of people. So first, the Lord has to create the nation of Israel, basically. And that starts with um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It actually starts perfectly with Jacob and his 12 sons become 12 tribes of Israel. And it's prophesied that through the tribe of Judah, later on through the descendant of David, Messiah would come. But in this, all these prophecies, and there's pre-flood prophecies, prophecies from Noah and Shem and the yeshiva and all the way down, and then the ones we know about from Moses in the scriptures. But uh, in the scrolls that go all the way back in the Testaments, they refer to it as a plant. So there are mighty oak, not oak, excuse me, mighty cedar trees like the cedars of Lebanon. And each one of the trees represents a Gentile nation. And it's just a, a nation like any other nation on the planet. But the Lord does something special and creates this other plant, uh, plant, tree, vine, however you want to call it, but it's just a plant in Hebrew. But this other plant then is what the Messiah comes from, and eventually the plant is the Messiah. And so we see that replicated in the Old and the New Testament on out. Paul talks about that in, in uh, Romans, about how uh, there's the, the olive tree uh, or the, the, pl the plant. The Messiah is the root, and you've got wild olives and tame olives or cultivated olives. And so the cultivated represents Jews, and the, un, the wild olive branches represents the Gentiles. And sometimes we get confused and think that we're grafted in Jews, and that's not what it's saying. The Jews are in Messiah. That's how it all started. We're grafted into Messiah because we continue to produce wild olives. They continue to produce cultivated olives. So that's the, the concept. But in that case, it's called an olive branch. And when you go back and you look through all of these things, what's really interesting is when the plant that God makes, the one that Messiah comes through, when that plant understands or that nation understands and is believing, it's referred to as an olive tree or an olive plant, be it wild or, uh, you know, Gentiles are wild. But if it's an olive tree, an olive plant, it's believing. So there's believing Gentiles and, un and believing Jews. When the nation is unbelieving, walking in apostasy, it's referred to as a fig tree. And it, this is consistent all the way back to the beginning and all the way through. So it's really amazing when Jesus talks about the fig tree, the budding of the fig tree. Well, again, so the nation of Israel, it's, it's the plant, comes back, but still in unbelief. If they came back messianic, they wouldn't be called a fig tree. They'd be an olive tree. And so that's what's really interesting about it. So with all that in mind, that's that's a teaching from the Dead Sea Scrolls. We, we pull this together and we see that in Ezekiel 38, or excuse me, 37, Israel comes back as a nation, again, completely alive, but it has no breath or spirit in it. So it's not messianic. It's still a fig tree, not an olive tree, which exactly is what happened in 1948. Now, what's interesting, though, is we would put that together because we know the New Testament, the Old Testament, and then a couple of the, the prophecies. But in this uh, one document, and I'll just show that here, it's this one. It's uh, 4Q385. It's referred to as pseudo-Ezekiel. And what we've been talking about uh, recently uh, is the fact that you've got the uh, proper documents. In other words, we've got pieces of Ezekiel, and when you translate them out, they're just Ezekiel, just like the Masoretic text, the Hebrew. It's just Ezekiel. And then you've got things like this that seem to be either rewritten 
or have comments with them. And rather than saying that they're rewritten, they have comments, they're different, they, they refer to them as pseudo Ezekiel or that kind of thing and say like, I wonder which one was first, which one, who wrote what or what. And it's a possibility somebody changed the text or whatever, I suppose. But when you look close at these things, they turn out to be just commentary. So there's the Bible passages, the very clear commentary where it says Ezekiel, you know, and it'll quote like verses one and two, and then say, this means to us, blah, blah, blah. Then they'll quote three and four. This means to us, blah, blah, blah. So it's obviously quoting a verse or two of scripture, giving a commentary and going back and forth. So that's definitely, everybody agrees that's a commentary. So with these things, though, they're thinking maybe it's something else. It's like a rewrite. While they're just doing the commentary different, they're putting their commentaries in and not saying this is the scripture, this is the commentary, kind of all jumbling it together. Most of our study Bibles will have the text. You know, if you just think about it, the text is the biggest part of the book up at the top, and then there's a little footnote section. They usually have a different font. It's smaller. And maybe there's a line or a, a pretty graphic or something, and you can tell text, commentary, very easy. Well, they don't do that kind of thing with those scrolls. But sometimes you'll find, I think there's, I can't think of the name of it, but there's one study Bible that I had that put all of the comments instead of like a, a note like, you know, Jesus came to Nazareth and then an asterisk or a number one or something. Down at the bottom, the number one says Nazareth is a city in in, in Galilee or whatever. Um, instead of doing that, they'll just put that right in the text. And unless it's color-coded or something, it's really hard to tell what's the commentary and what's not. So it's not a really great way of doing it. So anyway, I'm just saying in my personal opinion, the pseudo-Ezekiel is simply Ezekiel. Now, if you study it and listen to people that think it's something else, they'll say it's Ezekiel. It's basically word perfect, except it's missing two sentences. And one set of sentences is over here instead of like this. And maybe they did that for emphasis. Um, maybe they're trying to sell, tell you that instead of this happening before this, it's actually like this. Maybe, maybe not. But it's still the text. It's not really much to argue about. But then they have extra comments. And I'm going to say extra comments is commentary. So um, I don't think there's, a, I might be wrong. I might find something tomorrow that's really strange. But so far, it's just a different form of commentary. So in saying this, this is what's really cool. Because in 4Q385, you have Ezekiel talking about the Valley of Dry Bones. It's basically the same. It's missing a verse, which means it's either missing the verse, it got smudged out, torn out, or it's actually, you know, different, whatever. But the, the text is the text. <clears throat> but the one thing that it does have, and it's really interesting at the end of it, uh, he says, you say, and they, the, um, they stand up and they get life in them and they come back and everything. And the Lord says, this is a whole house of Israel all the same story, but then it has like just one sentence tacked on at the end. And the, the prophet Ezekiel says, when shall these things be? And God answers him and says, when the plant that is now bowing down straightens up erect. So if you got to stop and think about this for a minute, if as a human being, I'm standing up erect. You come to me and you say, hey, hey, I'm a king. You bow down. I say, no. And you would probably would kill me unless I've got people around me that we're not bowing down, which means we're a force to be reckoned with. We're independent. We're an independent nation. So that standing up straight is strong, proud in a good sense. You know, you are in control. Um, if you're attacked and you're subservient and it's like you bow down to me or I will kill you, there's no choice. You have to bow. And so bowing down shows that you're in captivity and slavery or metaphorically even death. And standing up would be in li life and in, in strength. 
So in this case, if we have the plant, which is Israel, and we're told this is the whole house of Israel, and when will they come back as a nation when the plant no longer is bowing, but stands up straight or erect, as it says. So in this time, in Ezekiel's time period, they're in Babylon. They're serving the other group. So this would fit when they come back from Babylon because they're independent because of Cyrus. So at that time, it's a kind of a partial fulfillment, but they're believing in Messiah. According to the, the rabbinic, not rabbinic, but the Dead Sea Scrolls, they believe in Messiah. They put the apostasy away. They go back to doing exactly the way Moses taught. And the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us how Moses taught, and that's without the Pharisee, Sadducee, party of the circumcision stuff. <clears throat> Believing Messiah is God incarnate, will come and die for our sins, etc. So that's believing. So that's not, they come back as a nation, but have no spirit in them. So that's interesting. So at that point, we would say, well, if that's the case, the only other time that they come back as a nation was, would be 1948. They come back not believing in Messiah. They believe in a coming Messiah, but they don't recognize who he is. They're not messianic. So that would fit. So we would say it's the budding of the fig tree uh, in 1948. And Ezekiel then talks about when the um, plant, which if, it's, if we're talking about Israel, is now bowing down in subserviency, stands up straight, or bowing down in heresy, and eventually stands up straight. So they become actual believers. Uh, so, Or it could be referring to Jesus, because Jesus is the main focal point coming through the, the uh, nation of Israel. And sometimes it'll be obviously talking about the Messiah rather than the nation that brings the Messiah. Depends on how far back we're, we're looking at manuscripts. But Jesus did die and resurrect. So it's really interesting just to kind of see just that one sentence. It could mean a couple of different things. But obviously the nation of Israel comes back first in unbelief. And this happens when they who are bent down straighten back up. It's the plant again. So we're talking about that specifically. So it's, it's interesting. It doesn't give us any really new information because we have even more information than that from the new testament the budding of the fig tree for instance and the olive uh the grafted in olive tree that paul talks about um, but it's the same thing all the way through just kind of wanted to share that with you so this is another example of a of a prophecy with a little more detail uh that gives you a christian interpretation without the new testament so it's a good witnessing tool um Plus, again, it shows that we're probably going to wind up not having a second Ezekiel and a second Daniel, but just commentaries on Ezekiel and Daniel. Now, I'm sure they wrote other things, but the point is, what are we finding in here? So I, we don't want people to go off the deep end and think we're adding to Scripture or to, to say that, you know, there's a second Daniel and then fall into some Gnostic work and get off that way. So we need to be really careful of that. Remember, the basic teaching was that in the time of Ezra, Ezra closed the Old Testament canon. So we have, in the way the Protestants break them up, 39 books. The Jews break them up, and I, I believe 22, because they put First and Second Samuel together, First and Second Kings together, Ezra and Nehemiah together, and then First and Second Samuel together. And then the 12 minor prophets are a book called the 12. So if you do that, you, you run the 39 books down to 22, but it's the same, same text, same set of books. It just depends on how you divide it. But anyway, that's the rule and guide of faith until the new covenant scriptures would come, uh, which is prophesied also by them. So all this other stuff would be commentary, history from the 400 silent years. Very, very important for us to know but not to be considered scripture. So just wanted to throw that out on there. So now let's go back and look at this uh, as far as the calendar goes. Let me go back. So with the calendar, we have a weekly Sabbath. And the Sabbaths have to remain perfect. So you can't have 
like the Gregorian system, you have an extra day every so often that would throw your weeks off. Uh, so you need a 364 day calendar to keep the weeks perfect, which means you'd have to have a leap week. And there are four months or 12 months of the year, not ever a 13th month. And there are four seasons, um, winter, spring, summer, and fall. Okay, so let's let's go back here to this, and I want to show you a couple things. Here is a, yeah, it came out pretty good. This is from my book, um, Ancient Dead Sea Scroll Calendar. Um, but basically, uh, we'll, we'll show how this works. So you have, again, spring, summer, autumn, or fall, and winter. So it's the four seasons. So in one calendar year of 364 days, you, you divide that into four pieces, and we do that on every calendar, spring, summer, fall, and winter. But each one of the seasons has three months. And the three months are 30 days apiece. So it's really simple. It's not like our system where this, this is January. No, this is February, right? We're getting ready to start March. So I have to stop now and think, how many days is in February? Well, 28. 28, not 29 or 30. Or 31, like January. Why 28? You know, it's how do we how did we get there? And then I have to stop and think. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's normally 28, but if this is a leap year, the leap day that we add to it is at the end of February, so it'd be 29. So is this a leap year or not? So I have to figure that out, and then figure out how that connects on the week, because the week could be, who knows when it starts. Uh, so, or the, you know, the Sunday or the Monday that we start the week, what day is that going to be on in March or at the end of February? Don't know. We'd have to stop and do a lot of calculations and look it up, look it up on a calendar. In this case, it's actually pretty easy. So every month is 30 days long. So 12 months of 30 days is 360 days. And a lot of times in scriptures, and this will help with figuring the prophecies, we're talking about a year of 360 days and we're talking about that because in the months in the calendar months there are only 360 days okay but in a year we have the uh, actual equinoxes and the um, solstices are called a tekufa and just to make sure we remember this um the sun shining on the earth when the earth is at a, earth is at an angle so when the sun gets at a certain point it's right on the equator so the day and the night is the same and at that point it's spring or it's the beginning of spring or the beginning of fall so really nice weather when it's when it goes around to where the sun is shining at, at the top level uh, the northern hemisphere then we have summer it's about as hot as it gets when it's at the bottom on the southern hemisphere, it is as cold as it gets. So that's our winter. So whenever we're having winter, we're just coming out of winter, warming up. The southern hemisphere is coming out of summer. They're just cooling down. And so that's the way that works. But the days that they mark this, the longest day of the year would be the um, uh, height of summer. The shortest day of the year is the height of winter. And then the equi those are solstices, the longest day, the shortest day, which is the hottest and the coldest. And then the equinoxes are uh, vernal, which is uh, spring, and autumnal, which is fall. And those are the ones that should be nice. A day and night, the darkness and the light and the heat are all even. So with that in mind, the vernal equinox is the first day of spring, or it marks the day of spring. It's usually on a certain day, somewhere in the middle of the day. And so the very next day is the first full day of spring. And that begins the first day of the first month. So it'd be first of Nisan. So what we do is we have 30 days of Nisan, 30 days of Iyar, 30 days of Savan, and then that's spring. And then we have the very, the, the equinox or the summer solstice rather, which is over here. And then we have 30 days, 30 days, and 30 days of summer. So early, mid, and late summer. Then we have a fall equinox, 
and that day again it's called just a tacufa an equinox or solstice whatever you call it it's, it's all tacufa and then 30 days per month of three months so 90 days and then the first day of winter and or the, the solstice and then the three months of winter so each one of these is 30 days so it's 360 days inside the months inside the year though with these four days added it's 364 days and 364 days divided by a seven day week comes out to exactly 52 weeks so every new year for instance on this calendar is on a Wednesday. It always starts on Wednesday, which makes Passover, the 14th of Nisan, always on a Tuesday. We'll see that in a minute. So it's really easy. If you were to ask me coming up this um, this next year, when is New Year's? Well, it's the 1st of January. Yeah, but is it a Monday, Tuesday? I don't know. It's different every year. I'd have to look it up. So there's a lot of really interesting things with this. So when someone says it was the such and such month of day of the month, and then three or four days later, something happened, we see that a lot with Moses back in Exodus and those places in the Old Testament. And we see it a lot with Jesus and in Acts. And it really does tell us a lot because if it was a certain day, two or three days later, we know exactly what day of the week it was, which tells us if it was a Sabbath or not. Really easy. You don't have to go back and look at star charts or anything. You just know. And all of a sudden, you begin to realize, hey, he did this on a Sabbath. He did that on Yom Kippur. So he went in there and talked to that guy. And that was like two days before, ooh, that would have been this, you know. And you just all of a sudden know a lot. So it's understanding the calendar is really important uh, for us. So let me... Uh, um, mention one other thing here. There's the book of Jubilees, and I just want to read you a little piece of it. This is in chapter six uh, of Jubilees. And in chapter six, I'll back up here a little bit. It talks about Noah. This is after uh, the flood, Noah's sacrifice. And this is all recorded in Genesis eight and nine, but the, the Noahide laws, the rainbow covenant. And so it talks about that. And then it comes down here with uh, the, the rainbow and the festival of weeks, which is um, uh, past Pentecost, rather. Again, very, very important. Uh, the Feast of Pentecost uh, focuses on covenants that God gives with man. So the Noahide covenant, bringing of the law on Mount Sinai, the covenant of grace on Pentecost that we know of, Acts chapter 2. And there were others and will be others. So anyway, um, so that talks about that. But let's come down here to the calendar. So this is interesting. So I'll just read this to you. It says, um, For I have written in the first book of the law, in that which I have written for thee, that you should celebrate it in its season, one day in the year. And I explain to thee the sacrifices that the children of Israel should remember to celebrate throughout the generations, through the month, every one in the day, on the new moon of the first month. Now, this is what's interesting. Now, a lot of times this word here is um, for new moon. It actually means new month. Uh, there's a different word for moon uh, than, than a Kodesh. And so if we're doing a modern Jewish calendar where the months begin on a, on a new moon, it wouldn't make any difference what word we use. New moon, new month, be all the same. But since we're using a solar calendar, that's what makes it really interesting. So that can't be a new moon. So the Kodesh is actually the beginning of a month or the beginning of a season. So probably a Tekufa. Um, so anyway, on the new moon of the first month and on the new moon of the fourth month, and the new moon of the seventh month, and the new moon of the tenth month. Those are all days of remembrance for the seasons and the four divisions of the year. So now we understand that it's the first day of the first day of the new of the first month of the um, first, fourth, seventh, and tenth. And when we look at the calendar, that would be the tekufas. That would be the actual days of 
the first day of spring, summer, fall, and winter. These are written and ordained as a testimony forever. Noah ordained them for himself as feasts. Now, I want you to understand this. God gave Noah the Noahide laws, so we're all as Gentiles bound to those. But then Noah turned around and ordained these feasts. It doesn't say that God told Noah to ordain the feasts. So these aren't binding on anybody, but it's just an excellent practice. Okay, so you don't have to do... Basically, the rule of thumb is if it's a ritual, you don't have to do it. And in some cases, if it's a ritual, you don't want to do it. Just observe or study it or leave it alone. Uh, but in any case, in this case, he ordains, Noah ordains, uh, for himself as feasts for the generations forever, generations of all the Gentile nations, all of us, so that they have become thereby a memorial unto him. Um, and then it goes on and talks about the things that happen on the first of those months. He entered the ark. He saw the tops of the waters. The waters begin to recede, and he leaves the ark. And so that's an interesting thing to study. Um, let's see here. On this account, he ordained them for himself as feasts for a memorial forever, and thus they are ordained. Now, when I put this book together, this is kind of interesting because I put this together and I made a comment at the bottom because the the solstices seem to be fine, or the equinoxes rather seem to be fine, but the solstices seem to be flipped. And I'm thinking like, how did they flip that? Not understanding that this is not the modern Jewish calendar. The year does not start in the fall. The year starts in the spring, which means the equinoxes are still the same, but the summer solstice and, and uh, winter solstice are flipped. So again, that just shows us more evidence of that particular calendar. Um, so anyway, the point is here. Uh, let's see if it says anything here. Uh, he placed them on the heavenly tablets. Each had 13 weeks. That's a season. Uh, from one to another, which passed to their memorial from the first to the second, second to the third, third to the fourth. All the days of the commandment will be 52 weeks of days, so 52 weeks, these will make an entire year complete, 52 full weeks. That's 364 days. Thus, it's engraven and ordained on the heavenly tablets. And there is no neglecting this commandment for a single year or from year to year uh, for the children of Israel to observe these years according to the reckoning of 364 days. These will constitute a complete year and will not disturb its time from the days, from the feasts, for everything will fall on them. And it goes on, and there's a prophecy that the calendar gets corrupted in the end times, uh, which apparently happened 200-ish BC uh, when they adopted the what becomes the current Jewish calendar, uh, which is a lunar one. You're not supposed to have a, a lunar calendar. So anyway, but I just want to point these out. So let me go back to that chart again. So the concept is when you hit a tekufa, the first day of uh, spring, summer, fall, or winter, you're supposed to have a memorial. And the concept is your family gets together. It's not a ritual like you think of a big elaborate sacrifice. You just get back together with your family. You have a meal, a potluck, whatever. Kind of like we get together for Thanksgiving. It's just a time that's set aside. You take off work. Hopefully you have it off. You know, you come back and you fellowship with your family. You catch up on what's going on. You fellowship. You focus on repentance and prophecy specifically. So every time you come back together, the first questions is like, okay, three months ago we were together for the last Takufa. Has there any been any, any prophecies fulfilled recently? Well, no. Okay, well, anything going toward a prophecy. Well, the president did this and Israel did this. Just make sure that you're up on current events, you know. And this, of course, is before internet. You might be out in your fa farm 70 miles or 100 miles from here, and the only time you ever get updated news would be a tekufa. Um, And then is there a problem with anything? Do we need to pray for each other? Do we need to repent of our sins? That kind of stuff. And so those are the most important things, prophecy and repentance. 
So I think that's really fantastic to do. So again, and then you've got your three months for planting and harvesting and winter and whatever it is that you do and get back together with your family. So I just wanted to share that with you. Now let me exit out of this and go to, okay, let me just uh, grab this here. I must have closed it or something. Okay, let me do it this way. Okay, here's our site, and this is us talking again. Looks a little blurry. Okay. Anyway, DSS calendar, and in here we could go to, here's the upcoming one for this year. So this is the 20 AD 2021 to 2022 calendar. And again, it always starts in the spring, not the fall. So as you can see, the day that it works is you have a Takufa, and these are calculated because they're going to drift. Uh, every year it's going to be a day or two off. And when it gets more than three days off, you add a week. And so now it's within three days on the other side. So every five to six years, you have a leap week and it puts everything back. So every Tuesday, you have a Takufa, the first day, the spring day of remembrance, the first day of the, of the month, which would be first of Nisan, would be that Wednesday. Now, the real solstice is actually on March 20th. So you can see this year, it'll be right here on Saturday, the real uh, solstice. So what happens, we've went one, two, three days back. So next year, we would go four, unless it's a leap year, it might be five. But when we get more than three days off, what we're going to do is add seven days. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So now it's going to be three days the other direction. And then it'll be two, then it'll be one, and it'll be exactly on that equinox. So the equinox will actually be here, and then it'll go Tuesday, Wednesday, on down. And then we'll have another leap week. Uh, so anyway, so this year, calculating that, we don't want it to ever get more than three days away from the... Um, uh, the Wednesday, New Year Wednesday, to never get more than three days away from the actual um, spring uh, equinox. So, but here's the calculated one, first day of spring on this calendar, uh, first full day here. And then, of course, Passover's here. And so we'll go on down. Let me back up here for a second. We'll exit out of this one. And where am I at? Here am I? Okay. Let's go to the, our current one. This is our current year. So as you can see, it was March 17th last time. It's 18th here. So again, the net following year, it would be the 16th. And that's too far off. So you'd add seven days to it. And it would run it back up to 22nd or 23rd. But going down here, today is probably January, February. Today is the February 22nd which incidentally is my wife's birthday. So if you haven't said uh, happy birthday to her, uh, I'm very, very blessed to be married to such a wonderful, godly woman. Uh, but I digress. Okay, so anyway, here is February 22nd. It's a Monday. We're doing our Monday festival. So it's the 9th of Adar on this calendar. So we have one, two, three weeks, basically. And then the very next uh, Tuesday, three weeks from today, will be the, the Takufa. So the following Wednesday will be the first full day of spring. So uh, my family and I and Bible study group are going to try to get together on Takufas, which it just dawned on me, Bible study group always comes on Tuesday. So that's going to be pretty easy. It's always going to be on a Tuesday. So anyway, and it doesn't matter when you get together, but it's just kind of a a neat concept for family to get together, focus on prophecy and repentance. That ought to keep you pretty holy, I would think, when you're seeing things that prophecies begin to be fulfilled and things like that. So, and then of course, Purim is on the 14th of Adar at that point. So it's a pretty interesting calendar. Let me go back again to this one. I'll show you what I mean. So it ends on March 16th. So the new year should be on the 17th. 
So if we come back to this one, sure enough, the new year is on the 17th. Now, when we go all the way down next year, it would be 16th. So let me show you what happens. You get all the way down here. See, 14th, it would be the, the 14, 15th, would be the 16th is the full day. And that's too far away. So you add a leap week. So the leap week starts on the 15th, takes us up to the 22nd. So we would start on the 23rd. And then every year we'd get one or two days off. So it would go from 23 to 22 or 21 to 20, where it should be, 19, 18, 17. And again, when it starts to go here, we would add a leap week. And that's how it keeps regulated. Because uh, again, you don't want the uh, first day of spring to wind up being in the middle of winter or in last fall or in the summer. And that's what would happen if you continually let it drift. So this is how we do that kind of thing. Just kind of wanted to remind you of that. And you can always come here and look these up. You can look up each uh, year. Like I was born in 1965. So I can type that in here. 100 years before or after. 200 years around our date. So in 1965, the year I was born, was the year 5890, uh, according to their calendar. And I was born on October 9th. So when we come down to October 9th, where am I at here? October 9th. Uh, so this is Saturday. And it was the 25th of Tishrei. Is that right? Yeah. So that's when I would have been born. So pretty interesting that you can do this kind of stuff. And again, our, our calendar might be off as far as calculating when the leap years or the leap weeks are, are interspersed. Um, but it's got to be really, really close. Other guys that have calendars like this, like Zadok Way, and there's several others, they're basically identical, except if he has his leap week uh, next year instead of this year, then there'll be a year or two where we'll be off a week. So it'll be pretty interesting to see, but we're really close. After a year or two, we come back to being exactly identical again. And that's the only thing that's still a little confusing because uh, there's one text in Enoch that says New Year should be after the sign, the Otot, which is um, probably the, um, the Tekufa, the actual Tekufa. So the concept is uh, the actual spring equinox is here and I'm waiting till I get three days behind and then I add a week, which puts me three days ahead and then I let it drift. So that always keeps it within three days. The other guys think that it always has to be afterwards. So you start at the Takufa and you let it go seven days. And then you set it back to the Takufa and then let it go seven days. So it's instead of overlapping like this, it's always on one side. So for three out of the six years, um, I'll be off one week from theirs. Other than that, it's identical. So. But the most important thing is to have this calendar fixed this way. And when, you, when you're reading the Gospels or anything like that, and it says it was Tishrei 7, or the 7th of the 7th month, and exactly five days later, something happened. Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Hey, that was a Sunday. You know, and so you begin to see stuff like they would do things on a Friday on a Sabbath, they would do things on a Sunday. And it, hey, that one would have been exactly two days before Tabernacle starts. I bet that's why they were hurried to get back, you know, and you just all of a sudden learn a lot of things. Well, that's all I wanted to share with you, but I wanted to share it because some people were asking about the calendar, how it works. So again, the Way to do this is the Wednesday closest to the spring equinox, which is the Wednesday closest to March 20th, is New Year's. That's just always the way it works. And then you've got the calendar to, to figure out. And every so often you add a leap week. And the concept of the Takufas is that as believers, uh, and this is just something that Noah ordained. Again, it's not he doesn't have authority to tell us what to do. God does. Um, God gave him the Noahide laws, so that's binding. You can't kill people. 
you can't fornicate, you can't lie, you can't steal, you can't commit blasphemy, and you can't commit idolatry. Those are very, very serious offenses. But then Moses, or Noah adds, let's have, make these memorials, and because they're in the calendar, it's the special days, four times a year, get together and have a memorial. Focus on prophecy, focus on repentance. So very, very interesting. I get in trouble sometimes because there's there's a there's groups of people called pan Babylonians and they think that everything is pagan. And I was told one time by this lady in this church that if you do anything connected with the summer solstices or equinoxes or anything like that, that's just pure witchcraft. And it's you you've been led astray by demons and all this kind of stuff. And again, of course, she knows nothing of Dead Sea Scrolls, never went to seminary doesn't really know a whole lot about uh, too many things. Um, and I'm not trying to bad mouth or anything, but I'm just saying you can't make blanket statements like that. Um, I have absolutely nothing to do with witchcraft. I don't want to have anything to do with the occult. But if this was an idea that Noah came up with, again, not binding, but hey, why not? Now, a derivative of this, think about this for a minute. We... Family tends to get together around Easter, which is around spring. We get together around Thanksgiving and Christmas, especially Christmas, because Christmas is within four days of the, well, usually three days, within three days of the equinox, or the solstice, rather. Um, and then uh, the fall seasons, I don't know what else would be around those. But in other words, there are holidays, American holidays, within a half a month or so of a lot of those. So you could just get together on the holidays and focus on repentance and prophecy. So whatever you do is as often as you can do it, remember him, think on the prophecies, think of the, uh, the, the repentance, because we all make mistakes all the time. So we need to repent. We need to try to be as godly as we can. We need to try to walk in righteousness. And we want to watch for the times that we're in. So let me go ahead and stop there at this point, And we'll go through and see if there's any questions. See here. <clears throat> Let me see here. A few weeks ago, I asked a question uh, concerning hearing of God's voice. Jesus said that his sheep will hear his voice. What is Kin's thoughts on this? Um, I think that. I mean, the Holy Spirit can can put things on our heart. Uh, I think the more in the scriptures we are, the more we understand. And Satan, through people, try to uh, deceive. Um, and it's not so much like try to get you to do something wrong. It's to try to get you to do something that's not right. You know, like a long time ago, someone said discernment is not knowing between right and wrong. That's actually pretty easy. Something that's really, really right and really, really wrong. But discernment is knowing between what's right and what's almost right. And I think that's the way we should focus on these things. People tend to, in politics, in religion, in all sorts of things, tell you all sorts of ideas. And it all comes down to your conscience. You read the scriptures and it says what it says. I mean, if you can read English, I, it should be pretty easy. Everybody says, well, you got to learn Greek and Hebrew and Latin, and that would probably help. You'd be extra sure that what you're doing, but you don't necessarily, if God wants want you to do that and you want to learn the language, by all means, go for it. It's a lot of fun. But if there's tons of scholars that have done many translations, and almost all of them, if not all of them, 
translate a certain word a certain way, that's probably the way it should be translated. So, but you can have friends that can look stuff up in Greek and Hebrew for you. But uh, we just need to hear the Lord's voice. We need to know what's right and what's wrong. There are times we're supposed to stand up, stand against the ways of the world, whether it means a, a problem for us or not, whether it means um, a reward for us or not. We want to follow what the Lord wants us to do. And some of that's obvious and other parts not. When do you witness and when do you not? That's something that's really hard. You have to rely on the Holy Spirit for that. So you do your best. If you think there's an opening, you make a comment. If they're receptive, you continue to talk with them. If they look at you like you're an idiot, you stop. So those kind of things. I, I think, hopefully, I'm answering that. But I don't think you can begin to hear the Holy Spirit or know for sure that you're hearing the Holy Spirit without reading the text, if that makes sense. So we just need to continue to study and put in practice the, uh, the uh, Bible in our lives as much as we can. That's a good point. The Fig Tree Association uh, with the forgotten books of Adam and Eve became the first fruit God gave to Adam and Eve was the fig tree. Satan stole it, buried it. Okay, that's why the fruit had to be planted. It's, yeah, okay. Didn't really think much about that, but yeah, it is interesting that, I mean, it could go all the way back to that, but again, a fig tree represents unbelieving Israel or unbelieving, the unbelieving part or time that the plant Messiah would come through would not be believing. When it's referred to as an olive tree, it's believing Israel. Um, let's see. What was the Zadok priesthood? Thank you. Uh, the Zadok priesthood is basically just the Jewish priests. What happened is you have the Melchizedekian line, which is the king-priest combination, king-priest-prophet, broken up by Jacob. And from that point forward, all the kings come through Judah and all the priests come through Levi. Well, later on, there were some apostasies and some problems and some focal points. So at a certain point, all the kings are supposed to come only through David, King David. So it's, it's shortened from Judah to David. Um, in the priestly line, it's supposed to always be Levi. And then you got Levi, Kohath, Amram and then Moses and Aaron, from his time forward, it's only supposed to be through Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood. Several generations down, you have an apostasy and a problem form, and Abiathar is kind of rebels and is ousted. And the true priest, the one that does what he's supposed to do, was a guy named Zadok. So at that point, the Zadok, or the priest, could only come through Zadok. And that's what the prophecies were. Now, just like you have in Kings and Chronicles, people that just take the kingdom and they're not descendants of, of David and they ruled and some of them were good and some of them were not, most of them weren't, uh, it's still illegal. You, the kingship has to go through David, uh, but evil people take it by force. So the priesthood, it, it would be an illegal priesthood as, unless you are a direct descendant of Zadok which is a descendant of Aaron, which is, is a descendant of Levi. And so that's the way it works. Now, later on, the Zadok priesthood is ousted and the Maccabean uh, group is put in. And they started out being godly to a point. I mean, they did what the Lord wanted them to do in the beginning, but it was still illegal. Um, they would, If they would have stayed rulers, it would have been fine. But then generation or two later, they decide they want to be priests and kings. You can't do that. It's illegal. And that's where we get this. The um, the Sadducees took their name from Zadok, Zadokesis or Sadducees. And they said, well, we're the real Sadducees. It just means a, you know, political type thing. No, it means a direct descendant of a person. There's real Zadok priests and fake Zadok priests. The Sadducees are fake Zadok priests. And the Pharisees basically said, yeah, we don't need to mess with it. Don't worry about it. Well, you do have to mess with it. And under the law of Moses, that dispensation, you did have to do it correctly or you're outside the will of God. 
but yeah, it's the Zadok priesthood. What's interesting though is you you could say that it's been replaced, it's been ousted, it's been changed or whatever. But we started talking today with, about Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, when you get in the last 10 chapters, it's talking about the millennial temple. It describes how the temple looks and all the things that they'll do at that time. And it mentions that the only priests that are allowed to be there are descendants of Zadok. So the Zadok priestly line has not been like ousted or gone. It comes back, so to speak, in the millennium for that Jerusalem temple. So it's all part of what God had in, had planned. So, but anyway, that's the Zadok priesthood. Okay. Yeah, the fig tree, um, the fig tree symbolism represents unbelieving Israel. And so there, there are prophecies all through the Dead Sea Scrolls and somewhat encrypted in the Old Testament of them rejecting Messiah when he comes. So that's the, the understanding. And the plant, uh, specifically the olive plant, is believing Israel. And there's a few other plants in prophecy too, anciently, but Basically, the main three are cedar trees, which represents a Gentile nation, the olive tree, which represents believing Israel, whom the Messiah comes through, and then a fig tree, which is an apostate Israel. Why are people up in arms about the Noahide laws? There seems to be some controversy, and I don't just see it. Um, it has to do with um, uh, the other groups. Basically, a long time ago, the way that it's taught in the Torah and in the scrolls is that Gentiles do certain things and Jews do certain things, and they don't necessarily cross. Uh, so the festivals, for instance, observing Passover, Pentecost, uh, first fruits, um, Shavuot, all those things are only for Jews. Gentiles are forbidden to participate. And that's directly, for instance, from um, Exodus 12. Jews are forbidden to eat non-kosher food, although Gentiles always have and always do, and it's perfectly fine. That's from Deuteronomy 14, 21. So there's a dichotomy. Women and children uh, can, you know, well, first Jews and Gentiles have to do some things together. Other things they're forbidden to do together. In the Jewish realm, there are Jewish men and Jewish women and children. And sometimes the women and children are forbidden to do certain things. And then under the realm of just the Jewish men, uh, they get to do certain things, but sometimes only priests, the Levitical priesthood, gets to do some things, and it's forbidden for Jewish men. And then the high priest, for instance, or the king, gets to do certain things that other priests cannot do. So there's no problem with it. It's just like um, um, if you break into my house, I might hold you at gunpoint or, or whatever, whatever I need to do. But I call the police and I turn you over to the police and they take you and they put you, they lock you up in a cell. Now I could have a cell in my basement and I could lock you up, but I'm not supposed to do that. I'm supposed to turn you over to the police. That's their job. And so the same kind of a deal. There's priesthood and things like that. Well, the party of the circumcision is kind of like the hyper Hebrew roots today. They get that confused and there's a whole body of literature uh, from the scrolls talking about why this is wrong and how it leads to apostasy. And so these people uh, think that for some reason the law of Moses, the full law of Moses, was ordained by God to Adam at the beginning of time. And that's why we all have to observe a Sabbath, eat kosher, sacrifice animals, all this kind of stuff. And that's actually not what we're supposed to do. Uh, and it's very clear in the Old Testament and in the New. So the thing is, we have this, the, there's basically Adamic law for the pre-flood world. 
and then it's reconstituted as Noahide law, which is Genesis chapter 9. And as an example, the food laws. Uh, Genesis chapter 9 says, as a Gentile nation, you make laws, you make sure you follow the moral points, uh, eat anything you want, just make sure it's killed and cooked properly. So there you go. But then you get to Leviticus, and Moses said, now for you, for the children of Israel, you don't eat just anything, you only eat these things. It's because they're symbolic of stuff, everything, all the rituals are symbolic. Then you get to Deuteronomy uh, 14, 21, and you see that the Gentiles, who are God-fearers living with Israel, always eat non-kosher, and Jews never eat non-kosher. But they're brothers. It's just part of a priestly thing. So, in other words, if I was part of the, the Hebrew Roots group or the um, party of the circumcision, and I accepted the fact that Noahide laws ever existed at all, it totally destroys my whole theology. Because if there was ever a time that Noahide laws existed and Gentiles could eat like pork, for instance, then uh, if I'm a Gentile, I have the option of converting to Judaism or staying Gentile. So when I come along and say, you've got to observe the Sabbath, you've got to not eat pork, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, that would fit if there were no law, Noahide laws, if only Mosaic law was the only thing. But if you accept the fact that Noahide laws ever existed in any way, shape, or form at any time, then the Mosaic law would be ritual law that was added to moral law for a time, which is exactly what Paul says in Galatians, that law was added. So it just totally messes up your theology. It's like, for instance, uh, Israel is supposed to come back in 1948, supposed to redo the nation, bring back the Hebrew language, all these prophecies, and they did. So that proves Israel has something to do with end time prophecy. Well, there are certain Calvinistic groups, their whole theology is that we have replaced Israel. So if that's true, Israel can't have come back and done pro fulfilled prophecy because that's us now. So that just can't happen. So we have to say that's all coincidences because it can't happen because my theology would be wrong. And that's the kind of thing that's going on. Um, you could be a Calvinist up to 1948, but at that point you ought to go, oops, I'm looking at this backwards somehow and just accept what you see. Uh, if you see all this evidence, all these many manuscripts talking about Noahide law, even uh, like Gad the Seer, which is 1000 BC, talks about Noahide law. A lot of people try to say that it's some fake thing that was made up in the Middle Ages, but we've got documents all over. Gad the Seer talks about it. Um, Seder Alam talks about it. Um, several others do. But that said, it just, it messes up their theology. You know, it's like if I had... Um, a document that said, or if, if my church said, you have to tithe at least $10 every single time you set foot in my church, or it's a sin, it's horrible, you know, you're going to go to hell or something like that. And that's my doctrine. And then I find an ancient manuscript that says, if somebody's poor and they can't pay it, they don't pay it. Matter of fact, if they're poor, you take them out and get them some groceries. It's a it's a, you know, you can't just do that. Well, that would mess up my whole theology, you know, and I'd probably lose money, you know. So you, I would say, no, no, that's got to be fake. That can't be real. So that's basically what they're doing. I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, Dolores donated $10. Thank you very much. Appreciate all the donations and all the questions. When do you see Passover occurring this year? I was in the impression it's the 14, 14 days after the first, but when is it exactly? Yeah, the Passover is the 14th of Nisan. The 15th is a high holy day, so you're supposed to not do any work or whatever. Going back to our calendar, I mean, you can, 
you can query, there's a lot of places you can go for the modern Jewish calendar, and they'll tell you what the Passover is on their calendar. But the, um, where are we at here? Ah, here we go. So this year, well, this next, it starts in March. So March 17th would be the first. So Passover would be on March 30th of this year, always on a Tuesday. So according to the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. And this is pretty interesting because people always get confused because they think that Passover, it was, it was a Sabbath, therefore it has to be Friday. Well, Friday is the weekly or low Sabbath. A high Sabbath is one of the, the seven festivals. So in this case, Tuesday, <clears throat> which is Passover, that night Jesus would have been doing the Passover ritual with his um, uh, disciples. And then he went out in the garden. He got arrested. The next day he was tried and put on the cross. So that would be Wednesday. Okay. So, but it's still the 14th, if that makes sense. It's still Passover. So he's arrested, put on the cross, executed. He has to be taken down before the 15th because that's a high holy day. So he's taken down, put in an airtight tomb before dusk. So he's in there for, the prophecy says, three days and three nights. So three full days and three full nights would be Wednesday night and Thursday, Thursday night and Friday, Friday night and Saturday. So he resurrects sometime after dusk on Saturday. So sometime late Saturday night after it's dark. Now, Sunday morning, they come to the tomb to do the spices and all that stuff and see that the stone is rolled away and he's already gone. So it happens exactly as uh, listed in the Gospels. And for the longest time, that was confusion because it's like if Passover was on a Sabbath that day and that was Friday, how do you get from Friday to Saturday and it's three days and three nights? You know, it's like Friday to Saturday night. Okay, day and a half. But it's like it doesn't, no matter how you do it, it doesn't fit. Uh, in this way, it fits perfectly. So it's it's really interesting. So the Dead Sea Scroll Passover this year would be March 30th. Uh, the official one on the Jewish calendar, we would have to look that up. And incidentally, on the DSScalendar.org, uh, what we have is this first one is the Dead Sea Scroll date. So today it's the 10th of Adar, 5945. Gregorian date is February 23rd, 2021. And the weekday and the time is always the same. Um, it's on, the, on our calendars. So it's on, in Israel, it's already Tuesday. So it's Monday night I'm talking now, but in Israel, it's already Tuesday. It's 341 in the morning, Israeli standard time. So the Pharisee date is Adar 11, 5781. So right now they're only a, a day off, uh, but we'll see what happens when sometimes they can be as much as a week and a half off. And so it, it changes ever so often. So is it good to come here and do that? So you've got these, you can search for a date, you've got the basic stuff, and this is mobile friendly. So if I run, if I see if I can do this here, if I run this down about like that is what it appears on my phone. So you've got these and you can still do all this stuff. Got books down at the bottom. So let me put this back so we can use it. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, that's where it would be at that point. Oh, okay. Uh, someone's asking, oh, let me hide that real quick. Someone's asking right here. I do that. I guess I can't do that. Anyway, right down here, I have the biblefacts.org right under me right here. There we go. Biblefacts.org is my website. And over here is a Calvary Chapel dove. It just shows you that I'm Calvary Chapel. You know, if, if you have studied Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapel type people, we just go over the scriptures and we're all uh, pre-trib rapture people. Um, just basic, basic Christians, you know, basic study stuff. So anyway, uh, over here, they mentioned that uh, this is a four-pronged shin. Normally there's three prongs and it's just the, 
the letter S or SH in Hebrew. But occasionally you'll see this four-pronged shin. And the question was about the four-pronged shin. Uh, the four-pronged shin. Oh, that's Donita. Okay, I already answered that one. Well, the question was, what is the four-pronged shin? Why do I have it on there? And uh, what's interesting is it only appears on the Teflon. Now, Teflon is the, the little black box that uh, Jews would put on their forehead. And it, it reminds you of the ages. So it's a symbol of the next age, basically. And um, it was a symbol of Elijah's school of the prophets because they count the ages and look at the prophecies. So anciently, it's uh, this one right here. It's a symbol of prophecy, the school of the prophets, and their studies. Okay. All right. So it's a little after eight, and I think we've got through all the questions. But I wanted to, uh, a couple people were asking about the calendar. And again, it, this gives you a little bit of time. We got three weeks, basically, or a little over two weeks to plan if you're going to get together with family. And it's just kind of a neat thing to do, I think. Again, I'm not into doing rituals of any form. Um, I, mean, I mean, as a Christian, I always pray before I eat. And, you know, but I'm not into doing any rituals or anything like that. But his idea of having four days of the year as a memorial to get together with your family, have a big feast, talk about scripture, talk about mainly prophecy and repentance. I think that's fantastic. Can you imagine if we all got together like we do for Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving and Fourth of July and, you know, to watch the fireworks and everything, do all that fun stuff too. But somewhere along that day, talk about, are we focused on the Lord? Are we doing right? Do we need to repent of every, of anything? You know, no big deal. Just if there is one, just repent, try to fix it, go forward. Um, and then is the Lord doing anything? What do we know about the prophecies? Anything happened recently? Um, that kind of thing. Oh, let's see here. One person said, in the post-flood history book, that was the first book I ever did, uh, you quoted Geoffrey Keating, who said that Eber fled to the Tower Project, thus preserving the original language, Hebrew. There's a lot of linguistic evidence to support that. That's what I've heard, that Gaelic is very similar to Hebrew. Um, I don't know that that's true, or maybe it is or is not true anymore, but that's one of the legends that they had in some of those ancient scripts. I thought it was interesting, too, that according to his um, history, that um, when the Tower of Babel fell, all of a sudden there's all these multiple languages. One of the first things that people started doing is creating schools, linguistic schools. So you could come there and study uh, the Latin language, the Hebrew language, the Egyptian language, the main languages and go forward from there. So I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting. And then some of those schools become parts of legends and other, other histories. So, yeah, thank you. Oh, cool. Yeah, Taylor uh, and Marcy said, we like to tell the Passover story and roast a lamb and the kids really love it. Yeah, that's one thing that... We have to remember, since the law was for the Jews and the law has been set aside, the prohibitions are gone. So some people might tell you that you have to do the Passover or that you can't do the Passover. But that's part of the ancient angelic law. And so that's not something that's binding on Christians. So it's perfectly fine to study it or to even practice it. And I think that's great. Our, my church usually does that, too. We usually have a kind of a Passover. Um, they tend to make it more fun for the kids. They're usually doing the Passover and they read the story about the, um, the lice and the bugs and stuff like that. And people tend to, uh, that are walking around the room will throw out these little plastic bugs just 
and the, the kids really go crazy for that. So lots of neat things you can do to the kids to get them all fascinated with the Passover story. I think that's great. Yeah, Parler, Paula Archer, <clears throat> excuse me, said uh, maybe we should uh, uh, do the get together here and go over current prophecies once every four months. I think that would be great. And we, we definitely need to do that. I tend to get distracted on whatever pra uh, project I'm on. Like right now, I'm going through all the, the Bible manuscripts. Not a whole lot to show you uh, some weeks, but just to get all of that done is, is major. So I tend to forget to stop and smell the roses sometimes myself. That'd be great. Uh, so we need to do that. Like this last year, the only thing I can think of that's, I don't think there's any prophecies per se, uh, but things that kind of point toward it is we moved the embassy to Jerusalem showing that we recognize Jerusalem as uh, the capital of Israel. Now, if our current president undoes that, goes does the opposite, I mean, who knows? But it's just interesting to see those steps one step at a time. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and say good night, and we will meet again on Thursday, Thursday night, and go through uh, our Q&A. God bless you guys. Have a safe uh, rest of the week.